Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Tonight we want to look at verse 6. Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The word blessed, you remember, literally means happy. Or it's really intensive, how happy, or oh how happy. In Psalm 1, the word blessed there has the same meaning. Blessed is the man, or happy is the man. The Hebrew word esher is the word for happy. And it is translated in many of the passages in the Old Testament, blessed, and in many passages as happy. The same Hebrew word translated happy and blessed in the uh, 144th Psalm, verse 15. Uh, David said, happy is the people and that's the same word, Esher. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. The word for blessed is the word Baruch in Hebrew. Uh, they say Baruch Hashem, blessed is the name. Uh, and uh, so this word Esher is uh, actually, Esher is happy. So this Greek word is the equivalent of the Hebrew esher. It is happy is the man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Happiness is something that everybody is seeking. In our Bill of Rights, there is a declaration that we believe that everyone has the right for life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is something that everyone is pursuing. And in our world today, we see this mad pursuit for happiness. And yet happiness seems to be so elusive. Sort of like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The other day as I was driving over here on the freeway, I saw a beautiful rainbow in the evening. And it looked like the end of the rainbow was right over South Coast Plaza. And I thought, how appropriate. <laughs> but happiness seems to be as elusive as the end of the rainbow. Just when you think you are there, it seems to move just a little further beyond. And it's always just a little out of reach. But I see here a very fundamental error. The whole problem lies in the pursuit of happiness. Why do we call it the pursuit of happiness? Because it is something that you never seem to quite grab onto and hold on to it. You may catch it, you think, for a moment, and then it eludes you and you are again in the pursuit and it seems like people spend their lives in the pursuit of happiness. Man seems to always be pursuing it but never really finding it. Now Jesus didn't say blessed or happy is the man who pursues happiness. You see, the fundamental error is that somehow we've come to think that happiness 
can be found by pursuing it. But happiness cannot be found by direct pursuit. Happiness is found in a right relationship with God, and it is the byproduct of a right relationship with God. And so therein is the fundamental error, and that is why the world is in constant pursuit of happiness, never seeming to really grasp it, always just missing it, because they are pursuing the wrong thing. They're hungering and thirsting after the wrong thing. They're hungering and thirsting after happiness. But happy is the man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Think of how wonderful the world would be if everybody in the world was hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You see, they're all hungering and thirsting for happiness. But what a wonderful world it would be if we were all hungering and thirsting after righteousness. What a happy world it would be. There would be no more killings, no more crime. We could abolish the police departments and the judicial systems. There would be no more broken families, broken homes, children cl crying themselves to sleep at night. What a happy world it would be if everyone were hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Once again, we see the logical sequential order of the Beatitudes Blessed are the poor in spirit. I see myself in the light of God's righteousness. I realize how hopelessly and horribly undone I am in sin. And seeing that I mourn over my sinful state, I grieve of how I must have grieved the heart of God by my self-centeredness, by my selfishness, by the sin that is in my life. And I deplore my sinful state. Like Job, once he saw himself in the light of God's holiness, he declared, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, and I repent in dust. And ashes. We see our problems are with self, self interest, self concern, self seeking. And this is what leads to all of the miseries, all of the strivings, all of the fights and bickerings in life. It's the primary cause for the unhappiness because. Man is so self-centered. And I see that when I see myself in the light of God's love and God's revelation of himself. And I'm convicted and I mourn and I weep over my sinful state. It causes me to then have a Self-abnegation, actually. I don't like what I see. I don't like the self-centeredness. I don't like that ugliness of self. And I see myself as God sees me. And I see others in a whole different light. And it causes me to begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I desire and I long for the divine ideal 
to live righteously and to be right with God. What is meant by righteousness? As we noted earlier, we're not to hunger and thirst after happiness. Yet, that is what most of the world is doing today, and that hunger and thirst for happiness has infiltrated the church also. The hunger and thirst for happiness is what is behind this pleasure mania in our world today. And what a classic example we had of the world's hunger and thirst for happiness this last weekend. When what the world calls Super Bowl mania took over. And this whole big hype and the promise was, this is going to make us so happy to see these two teams battle it out and to find out who is really the best. And after the first drive by the Falcons <laughs> and that first field goal, and they were ahead three to nothing, oh, we saw the happy birds as they were celebrating and they could taste and see victory. But as the game went on, the happy birds weren't so happy. <laughs> and they left the field and they left the stadium a dejected lot of people. But the mania went to Denver and in the streets, the people were out celebrating, lighting fires, and doing all types of stupid things. They were so happy. <laughs> it was celebration day. They thought they found it. We finally found what we've been pursuing. Happiness, we're elated, we're excited. Our team won. But Monday morning, they had to go back to the routine of work. And many of them with heavy hangovers. <laughs> and now they're looking ahead to next year's Super Bowl. <laughs> and maybe Denver can repeat for the third time. Yes, it could very well be that Elway will come back for one more season <laughs> and we can be happy once again. <laughs> but in the meantime, it's going to be the old grind. The work a day. Happiness, how elusive. And what a great premium man puts on happiness. In the church, there are those who believe that happiness can be found through some kind of exotic spiritual experience. And so they chase around the country so they can get under the spout where the glory is coming out. And they hear that it's moving over here or it's happening over there. And you see them going, pursuing an experience. An experience that they hope will bring them happiness. But happiness doesn't come by experiences. And happiness is not found by pursuing it. Happiness is the byproduct of a right relationship with God. Oh, how happy are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness. True happiness is found in righteousness. Now, if I were a doctor 
and you were the patient, and you came to me complaining about headaches and a feeling of pressure in your head. You're having dizzy spells, and it feels like your eyes are being forced out of their sockets. Your vision has become blurred at times. If I would prescribe pain pills for you and suggest that you go to an optometrist and get fitted with glasses, I would be a quack. You see, if I only am treating the symptoms and not getting at the heart, I'm not going to help you. As a concerned doctor, I would order an MRI and I would want to find out if maybe there's a tumor in your brain that is creating the headaches and the pressure and the blurred vision, the dizzy spells. I would want to find the cause and deal with the cause and not with the symptom. And yet, so many times we find people only trying to treat the symptoms, not getting at the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is your relationship with God. And if you don't have a relationship with God, you're not going to be happy. There may be those moments when you feel that, oh, I finally arrived. There may be those moments in some kind of a new experience or a new relationship. But the newness will quickly wear off and you'll be right back where you were because all you did was take a pill that alleviated for a time the symptom but the cause is still there. You not, you're not in a right, right relationship with God. And if you're not in a, a right relationship with God, you cannot experience the true happiness that God brings. Man has a deep need for true happiness. And the world is offering the cures for the symptoms. But they're not getting to the actual cause of the real problem. And in treating the symptoms, they are actually destroying the patient. And the result will be not happiness, but multiplied misery. The misery will be greater than ever before. Righteousness is akin to justification, but it is not justification. Righteousness probably is more akin to sanctification. Now, we have been justified through our faith in Jesus Christ. But God wants to sanctify us by the Holy Spirit. And it is very akin to righteousness, that is, sanctification. God doesn't want to just forgive you of your sin. He wants to free you from sin. I desire to have an unhampered fellowship with God, and I know that sin breaks fellowship with God. And therefore, I need to be freed from the power of sin and live a life of separation, sanctification, a life of righteousness that I might have that unbroken fellowship with the Father. And my heart thirsts, my heart hungers after that righteousness that I might live in a close relationship with God. And the effect of it? As I'm living there in close relationship with God, my heart is so happy. My 
heart overflows, my cup overflows. I hunger and thirst to be right with God. I see the filth of the world around me. And like Lot, I find that my soul is vexed in the things that I hear and in the things that I see. And my heart longs for purity. I thirst for a world where God rules in righteousness. On Sunday mornings, as I hold these little beautiful babies in my arms to dedicate them to the Lord, and as I am praying for them, I have to confess, my heart goes out to these little ones. As I look at their precious little faces, as I see them responding and smiling back, and my heart is touched, my heart is moved, I love them. But also my heart is grieved because I know all of the filth and the corruption that these beautiful little children are going to be exposed You see, one of the problems in our society today is that the TV has become the major babysitter. We park the kids in front of the TV that they might be entertained so that we can go about and do the household chores. And before they're in kindergarten, They're being exposed to sex, to violence, to corruption. The cartoons are so filled with violence. I mean, they're constantly smashing until they're like a pancake. And shooting and everything in the car. And here the little kids are sitting there transfixed. They're almost hypnotized. And I think of all of this junk going into their minds. That's before they get to school where there they really then begin to get corruption from the other kids that have been watching similar things. And how my heart goes out. That's why so often I pray that God will somehow, some way, miraculously protect them from the filth and the corruption and the influences of this world. And rather, there might be that beautiful influence of God's Spirit molding and shaping their minds and their hearts. Because I know that the result of the world's influence is misery, it's pain, it's suffering. It's heartache to follow the world's patterns, to live like the world and doing the things of the world. Oh, the advertisers would like to make you think that this is great. This is the key to happiness. This is the path to happiness. But as Solomon wisely noted, There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And as Solomon observed the young man passing by the corner with the prostitute who comes out and approaches him and propositions him and he sees him walk away, he said he doesn't know it's to his death. Her bed is actually the gate to hell. And yet the world will paint it up as the gate of happiness and pleasure and all. But the misery that comes from it. And so the world is deceived by Satan. Way back in the beginning, what was it that Satan was offering Eve? Happiness. If you eat of that fruit, it's delicious, sensational. And it will make you like God. And he lied. Rather than making her like God, it stripped her from 
the relationship with God and from the image of God. And she became like an animal, dominated by the fleshly desires. The spirit died. She was deceived. The Bible tells us that she was deceived. And how many people are being deceived by the world today? Satan is the deceiver. And he is promising happiness in all kinds of perverted things. Perverted relationships. Promising happiness in the bottle. But he's a liar and he is a deceiver. And people who are pursuing happiness in these things are finding not happiness but misery, pain, hurt. Not only to themselves but to those that are closest to them. The pain that they bring, the suffering that they bring because of their foolishness. Jesus said, happy are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness is not one who just has received the forgiveness of sins, nor just power over sin. But he is one who longs for the freedom even from the desire to sin. You see, one of the problems with man is that though he hates the consequences of sin, and many times it's the fear of the consequences that keeps him from sin, Yet there is a desire for sinful things. And my heart longs to be freed even from the desires for sin. Jesus said that men will not come to the light because their deeds are evil and they love the darkness rather than the light. The desire is for the things of evil. Sin does have a tremendous attraction. It makes all kinds of promises that it cannot fulfill. It's like John said in Revelation 10.10, 10, that little book that the angel gave to him. He said, I ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey, but in my belly it became bitter. And so with sin, the taste in the mouth might be sweet as honey, but the end result is the bitterness within. The man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness is a man who wants to be like Jesus, to follow in his steps, to be pure as he is pure, holy as he is holy. He wants to live in fellowship with the Father even as Jesus did and to be able to say as Jesus did, I do always those things that please the Father. What does it mean to hunger and thirst after righteousness? Hunger and thirst are two of the basic body drives. They come right behind the air drive, which is the strongest drive we have. The thirst drive and then the hunger drive, and these were created by God in order that our bodies might be sustained. So God has so designed us that when our bodies get low on fuel, we get hungry. When they get low on oxygen, or low rather uh, on, uh, on the moisture, we get thirsty. 
The body has to maintain a certain level of moisture. It has to have food to feed the cells. And so God built in marvelously the the hunger drive and the thirst drive. And if it were not for these, we would probably soon dehydrate and uh, we would uh, die of malnutrition. Now, there's probably none of us who really have experienced to any great degree the hunger drive. We usually take care of it before it gets too great. It doesn't take much to stimulate taking care of the hunger drive, unfortunately. And unless you've been on a fast for a few days, you've never really experienced that real drive for food where about all you can think about is a hot fudge sunny. <laughs> Perhaps we have all been more acquainted with the thirst drive because all of us have been at that place where there wasn't available water. And uh, we got that dry mouth and we were really thirsty and, oh my, we could just dream of, of water. I can remember when I was a young fellow being so thirsty and making the mistake of trying to quench my thirst with a Coke. Now, while it was going down, I thought, yeah, this is what I wanted, but oh, man, it only increased my thirst. And so that is with so many things in the world. You think, oh, yes, this is it. This is quenching the thirst. This is what I was looking for. But the end result is only an increased thirst. But a thirst for happiness rather than righteousness. Now, in like manner, as my body needs food and needs something to drink in order to maintain my hemostasis, so spiritually, my soul needs a relationship with God. And down deep in every man there is that thirst for God. When Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink, he was talking about the spiritual thirst that is deep within every man. That thirst for God. But the mistake that man makes is trying to satisfy that thirst in the things of the world. in the things of the flesh. But the flesh and the things of the flesh can never satisfy that thirst, nor can even the things of the emotions. And we try to satisfy the thirst with emotional experiences. But the thirst is deeper than that. It's the thirst for God. And it can only be satisfied by a meaningful relationship with God. And when Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, he's talking about that righteousness that brings me into a meaningful relationship with God. I'm hungering and I'm thirsting for God. A meaningful relationship with him. And God placed that thirst there in order that my spiritual life might be maintained and sustained. David wrote, As the deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O Lord. My soul panteth for God, for the living God. The glorious promise, blessed are they, or happy are they, who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, 
for they shall be filled. Filled with what? Filled with righteousness. Here we see the grace of God because you can't fill yourself. You can't be righteous in yourself. This was the problem with the Pharisees. They were trying to be righteous by keeping the law. And Jesus illustrated that with the story of the Pharisee who was standing in the temple and saying, God, I thank you that I am not as other men, like this publican especially over here. But he said, they are extortioners, they're unjust, they're adulterers. But I fast twice a week, I give of all that I possess, tithes. And he was trying to be righteous on his own merits. But Isaiah the prophet had declared... But we are all as an unclean thing and all of our righteousnesses as our filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. He said our righteousness is as filthy rags. And, and th that's just not a good substitute. Paul the Apostle was seeking to be righteous by the law, being a Pharisee. But when he came to the knowledge and the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ, he said, those things that were once gained to me or I looked upon as the pluses, the righteousness by the standards of the law, by the paying of the tithes and all of these things, he said, I counted loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, for whom I suffered the loss of all things. But I count them as refuse that I might know him and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of Christ through faith. And Paul discovered that righteousness which is of Christ through faith, for which he gladly threw over all of those empty, vain attempts at being righteous. But you see, if I have attained a degree of righteousness because I have these ten rules on the wall and I can put my stars after each one each day, go down and say, yes, I was kind and I was loving and I was generous and I and put my stars on and I can fill up the board with gold stars. What's the result? Every time someone comes over, I say, look at my chart. <laughs> All those gold stars, that's me, yeah. What is it? It's self-righteousness. And it's not acceptable. I hunger and thirst for the righteousness that comes by a right relationship with God, which is made possible through Jesus Christ. And they shall be filled. The grace of God the imparting of that righteousness to me when I hunger, truly in hunger and thirst. In Romans chapter 7, Paul realized that his finest efforts came short. And he cried out, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he answered his own question, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gospel. Happiness comes through a right relationship with God, which comes by righteousness. So blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God will bring them into that righteous state. He has made me righteous. He has given me the power of the Holy Spirit to keep me righteous. And the result? Oh, so happy. Oh, how happy.
tonight? Would you say that you've been hungering and thirsting after happiness? Or are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? If you're hungering and thirsting after happiness, the odds are you'll never find it. But if you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you shall be filled. And as the byproduct, you will be happy. Oh, so happy are those which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Father, we thank you for the word of Jesus Christ. And Lord, how thankful we are that when we truly see ourselves, our wretchedness, and we really come to that place of repentance and mourning over our sin. When we see how hopeless and how helpless we are, and we begin to really hunger and thirst after you and after your righteousness, the glorious fruit. Lord, we pray that those that are tonight caught in a trap have been pursuing after happiness and as a result of that pursuit have found themselves in extremely trying and difficult circumstances. Torment. Sort of a taste of hell as they're in such torment over the guilt that they feel. And what they know they should do and should be, but just don't have the strength or the courage to get out of it. Lord, help them tonight that the hunger and thirst for righteousness will be so all-consuming that they will be determined to set aside the sin, the promises of Satan, the lies. And they'll begin to pursue, Lord, the right path, your path. In Jesus' name, Lord, help them. Set them free. Give them a love, Lord, for the things of God and the things of the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here in the front to pray with you tonight. God's been speaking to your heart. Maybe you're caught up in sin and and you're at that point where you're beginning to experience the pain of it, the misery of it. You want out, but you don't know how. Maybe to get out, come on down and let them pray for you. The Lord wants to set you free tonight. Maybe in your heart there's a real longing and a hungering after God and the things of God. You're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Come on down. Let them pray for you. God wants to work in your life tonight. God wants to do a mighty work in your life tonight. God wants to set you on the right path, the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Let God work in your life.
As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You. This is the end of this message. If you would like further information on any of our products or to receive our free catalog, contact The Word for Today. The address is P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628. Or you may reach us by our toll-free number, 1-800-272-WORD. That's 1-800-272-WORD.